So good evening, Joe. Want to Hello, everybody, and thank you, Michael, and uh, all at L Mulligan Grocer uh, for putting together this brilliant festival and, you know, having such a special whiskey to kind of celebrate the the end of the festival. So um, the little that I did over lockdown of packing, uh, filling small bottles and labeling them, sending them off, you did it for a whole festival that must have been uh, incredibly taxing at times but look at all it all worked out so congratulations and uh i'm very i have the easy job here because basically i think we're all red breast fans and that's why we're all here tonight and it really is a such a great example of irish whiskey as i suppose as it was in the past as it is now and as it should be in the future it is you know a single pot still Irish whiskey. It is uh, rich in heritage and rich in flavor uh, and all of those other cliches, but it also delivers every time. So each of the whiskies in the range is slightly different due to I've lost you there, Joe. I'm slightly tweaking the production process, but to talk about red breast and red breast dream cast, you must fundamentally understand the make up of the whiskey. So I'll basically I'll give you a little bit of the background behind it, but what I'd like you to do, yeah, am I back? Um, can I... you're, you're, you're in and out, um, but sure. we won't worry too much sure. about it because I think we've got plenty to drink, so... Uh, maybe get the first sample in the glass. No. They're back again. Oh, they're gone, gone again. Back in. Sure. No problem. Um, Grant, so. What I'd like to start is, do you know what I might do, Michael? Let's just move. Um, sound any better? Yeah. Okay, is that any better? Yes. yes. Can hear is that you. better? Yeah. Finally. Okay. So amazing. I just moved literally two meters across the room and it's better. That's so um basically um let's start with a whiskey. So hopefully you've got red breast twelve year old in your glass. That's sample number one, everyone. Sample number one. And if you don't know what it looks like, this is what Red Breast 12 year old looks like. Um, and the whiskey itself is 12 to 15 years of age. And it's made up from basically uh, two different types of pot still. So a light style of pot still and uh, what we call light pot, strangely enough. Um, and another type of pot still that we call mod pot. So it's kind of a medium uh, style of pot still, uh, fruity and sweet and uh, lighter in flavor, whereas the, the light pot would be more spirit forward. And each of those are aged in parallel in first fill bourbon, but uh, the light pot is also, there's another uh, proportion light pot aged in 
um, first fill sherry barrels, which have been seasoned with Oloroso sherry. And they're all aged for 12 to 15 years. And then it is bottled at 40% ABV. And um, it is, you know, it's last year, it got awarded at the San Francisco Wine and uh, Spirits Challenge. It got awarded best uh, world whiskey. So it is a, you know, it is also the most awarded Irish whiskey as well. It's, a, it's, got, it's won more awards than any other Irish whiskey, probably because it's been on the market since August 1912 or a bit longer because there are some people that have found um, publications uh, a little earlier than that that have advertorials advertising Redbreast 12 year old. So originally it was a Gilby's, uh, W&A Gilby's product. Um, but now it since 1991, essentially it's been made 100% by Irish distillers, but Jemison would have always produced the new make spirit uh, for it. So let's have a look at it. Let's have a look at the color first. And also look at the whiskey in the glass and you'll notice the nice legs that it has. And that's going to give you an indication of the mouthfeel. Um, and certainly with a, uh, with a whiskey like this, um, a single pot still Irish whiskey, you're going to find a lovely creamy buttery texture. So this is giving us a little, a little forewarning of that, of that mouthfeel. And then nose. And it's wonderfully rich and it's just got those raisins, a little bit of cinnamon, a uh, hint of nutmeg in it. Um, you know, other dried fruits like sultanas. Like it's 40% alcohol, but it's just really soft on the nose, very well rounded, very balanced. Have a little sip, slauncha. And you can immediately get those two fingers of pot salt spiciness on on the front of your palate. And they are therein followed by that creaminess as I was indicating. It's There's a lovely hit of fruit and definitely the influence from that American oak, the layers of vanilla there. And then that wood influence at the back, a bit of toasted oak um, and a lovely long, long finish. And then it leaves a nice, dryness at the front of the palate as well and basically this gives you this more some character i'd like to say that it has but i mean bang for buck it's such a incredibly good value and um, an incredibly uh, rich whiskey that delivers absolutely every time you know it's no wonder it's such a favorite with whiskey drinkers here in ireland and all over the world You find it when you go back to it again, there's a lot more of that pepperiness to it. Have another little sip, Slauncher. I drank all mine. You drank all yours. Well, that's a good sign. It's really easy to drink, but it does have layers of complexity. And it is something that is, you know, you can see why it's a, a firm favorite with people like I mean it's a bartender's favorite because they can recommend it to whiskey drinkers and you know they're guaranteed that people will be impressed by it and also as a, as a whiskey drinker like myself you go when you get a bottle you just know that you're going to enjoy it and as I said it's great it's really great value uh, for the for the price point um, so that's Redbreast 12 year old um, it is it is essentially the, the foundation of red breasts. It's what's, I suppose, encouraging whiskey drinkers all over the world to, to kind of get an introduction into premium Irish whiskey. Like if you think of the 86,000 uh, cases of um, premium Irish whiskey that are sold around the world, red breast 12 year old is over 73,000 of those. So it's really quite a significant, um, uh, it's really a significant and growing whiskey and you know it's grown this year in Ireland 
uh, it's growing at about 24% and it's grown in the US at around, or was pre, pre all of this stuff uh, at about 16%. So it's growing really strongly. And um, a lot of it comes from people just recommending it to their uh, friends and saying, have you tried this whiskey? It's one of those whiskeys that, that people uh, tend to recommend to each other. It's word of mouth. It's, and that's the wonderful thing about whiskey is um, sharing sharing uh, something that you found. now, make, And it's very well known to us, but it's new to a lot of people around the world. I, but let's I, move Sorry, I, go ahead, Michael. I, I first, the first time moved to Ireland in 2003, and I think the first sort of month I was in Ireland, I was still getting to grips with uh, Jameson, Paddy, Powers, Black Bush, you know, all the sort of what you'd find in bars, essentially. And then I, I, someone recommended to me, have you tried Redbreast? No, never even heard of it. And then out, out came a bottle of Redbreast, and that was me hooked. That was 17 years ago, and I'm still hooked. And I, I sometimes forget how much I like this, and because we get so much choice these days, but it's great to go back. And someone mentioned on a, sent a private message to me there saying, after trying some more unusual whiskies during lockdown, you sometimes forget how good an old favourite is, you know, and it really is. It's, it's, it's a classic go-to whisky, you know. If you're ever unsure what to buy, when you've got a choice of lots of whisky, then you, you can always default to Redbreast because it's never going to let you down. It's, it's always, it's just a great whiskey. In fact, I like it so much. I think of it, anyone who's on WhatsApp with me, I think that's my, a bottle of Redbreast is my profile picture on, on WhatsApp and has been for as long as I can remember. <laughs> Uh, Tina, yes, this has been recorded and will be uploaded on YouTube tomorrow. Uh, so, Jerry, I'll hand back to you. We'll move, move on there. Sorry. I think Jerry's going to have to move another meter. Can you hear us, Jerry? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah, you're back now. Back, okay. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. It's just I don't understand why it's doing that. It's uh, my sincere apologies, and hope it's not too distracting from from the conversation. So, um, what we're looking at is uh, Redbreast 15 year old. It's what I suggested that we move on to. Uh, Number is, two. Number two. Oh, good. I was hoping that would be the case. <laughs> so, so what's the difference between Redbreast fifteen-year-old and Redbreast twelve-year-old? Well, one bottle says fifteen on the label, and one bottle says twelve. And I know that's very obvious, but it is an older whiskey. Um, it's 15 to 19 years of age. That's why we don't have an 18 year old whiskey in the Redbreast range, because it wouldn't make sense considering the whiskey contains 15 to 19 year old whiskey. Also within, as I said, Redbreast 12 year old is first fill bourbon and first fill sherry. In the case of Redbreast 15 year old, there is first fill bourbon and first fill sherry, but also refill a large, um, a contribution of refill barrels. So second and third fill as well. And those barrels are, I suppose if you want to do two things, if you want to age a whiskey longer, it's going to get more influence from wood. But if you want to get, um, stop the wood being totally dominating the whiskey essentially, what you can do is use refill barrels. And the best way to explain this is, if you imagine a first fill barrel being a new, a brand new uh, tea bag, um, a second second time you make tea with it, it's going to be lighter. The third time it's going to be lighter again. And I suppose that's the best way of indicating um, how the uh, how the influence of the those refill barrels will be over the wood, um, over the whiskey. So what this will do is you'll get more of the uh, spirit contribution coming through, but also you're allowing that interactive reactive effect within the barrel to still happen without the wood totally dominating 
uh, the whiskey in the end. So when you look at the whiskey, so have a look at it. There. It is actually a little bit darker in the glass, but that would be because of the wood. But on the nose, there's much more of what I would call a herbaceous type note to it. Um, you know, I would describe it as, uh, you know, dried grass at the side of the road, or, you know, it's not quite cut grass in the field or anything like that. It's more, more of a balance between um, more of a balance between the spirit contributing and uh, and the uh, and also the the um, you know the, the wood contribution as well. So it's more greener. Uh, if you imagine red breast, obviously is red breast twelve year old is red, and uh, the, a lot of the color in red breast fifteen year old is green. And um, you know one of the things when you come to uh, talk to Billy Lighton, our master blender, is he um, smells in colors and shapes. So he has a very uh, clear, um, you know, when he's nosing certain smells and tastes, he actually sees colors and shapes. So that's how he builds things together. Um, and the colors on the bottles are, you know, are, are in no way um, a, a reflection of that, but it does. It is a greener, more herbaceous fit uh, whiskey. There's more green, um, what I would call, uh, not apples and pears, but more like green berry fruits, if that makes sense. So like gooseberry, uh, leaning towards that sort of note to it. And um, it's not as sweet on the nose. You know, there's not so much of a, an influence of that vanillin or, or those wood sugars as you get in the Reverse 12 year old, because they appear in higher, uh, contents in the Rebus 12 year old, but it's just really, really different. Um, fundamentally the same base whiskies, fundamentally put the same way together, but a little bit older, and also the introduction of, of barrels that have been used before, and you get a totally different whiskey. It's absolutely amazing. So have a little sip, let's launch it. So it's going to be spicier on the front of your palate. One, because it's 46% ABV. Second of all, this is non-chill filtered. So non-chill non filtration is simply a process that's used to uh, essentially remove excess fatty acid esters from uh, the whiskey, the final whiskey, to prevent hazing when either ice or water are added at a later date or if the bottle is left in the cold for a long period. It's, you know, it's a very similar thing. If you get olive oil and it gets very cold, a lot of those fats essentially will come together. And um, the thing is, they don't, these fatty acid esters don't appear in any great amounts in our whiskies because of the size of the stills. You don't get, and triple distillation, you don't get this huge carrier over of these. In Middleton, they started chill filtration in the early 70s. And the reason for that was simply to, um, it was a fashion, a fashionable thing. Um, everything was being chill filtered. So they thought it would be a good thing to have on the bottle chill filtered. And chill filtration now has become very unfashionable. So it is, in many of the whiskies that we produce, they aren't chill filtered. Like you think of whiskies like Green Spot, it doesn't say it on the label, but there are none non-chill filtered, um, and anything over about 43.4% ABV doesn't need to be chill, chill filtered because of the makeup of uh, the whiskey. But in the case of this whiskey, it's 46%, um, it's non-chill filtered, um, and uh, that 46% ABV definitely helps it to carry more flavor. What, what do you think, would you agree, everybody? I know you, I can't hear you, but... Just nod, nod if you agree with me. <laughs> Good, you're nodding, I love it. So um, that's uh, Red, Red Breast 15 year old. There was a question there from Mary. Uh, is this the new 15 year old? I, yes, I think Michael it is, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So it was first, first produced for a small 
a small corner whiskey shop in Paris called Le Maison de Whiskey. I guess they're a massive wholesaler uh, of, of whiskey and Le Maison de Whiskey were looking for a, a, an exclusive whiskey around Christmas of 2005. And this, there was a, a export manager called Michael Boren, who's a Danish guy uh, who lives in Nice, still lives there today. And himself and another gentleman called Michael Cunningham are really unsung heroes of Redbreast. They haven't been given the credit or any recognition for uh, what they did to ensure the premiumization of the brand. When Irish distillers didn't have a clue what to do with the brand and were more focused on, on um, you know, other, other matters. The two lads were off-selling um, bottlings to German wholesalers and travel retail and places like Le Maison de Whiskey. And basically going down to Middleton and saying, lads, what have you got? And can you make a 15-year-old one? And can you give us a single cask long before people were doing single casks? And one of those products was Redbreast 15-year-old. And it was, it became a, you know, it became a, a big hit with whiskey writers like Dave Broom and the late Michael Jackson as well. Uh, they were very uh, fond of this particular uh, two, two, 2005 Redbreast 15-year-old. Uh, they produced another one in 2006, but not to the same as uh, specifications. And then they went back to the original spec in 2009. And then again, that was so well received, they decided to release this in about eight years ago as a permanent member of the Redbreast family. So 15 joined Redbreast 12 year old uh, just before the launch of Redbreast 21 year old the following year. So that that is the story behind Redbreast 15 year old. And it did appear intermittently in the past, along with 10-year-old Redbreast, and obviously 12-year-old Redbreast was the standard uh, with W.A. Gilby's, but 15-year-old would kind of intermittently appear uh, from W.A. Gilby's in the past. So historically, there was a 15-year-old, and, and it was great to kind of bring that back. And it's often overshadowed by its older, um, um, double the price 21-year-old, which is just an absolutely stunning whiskey. But it is Redbreast 15 year old is half the price of Redbreast 21 year old, but not half as good. It is re it's a really great whiskey, and it, I think it's just often overlooked because Redbreast 21 year old is so um, stunning. So if there isn't any questions on on Redbreast 15 year old, we might move on to our our uh, next whiskey. Oh, I wonder what that is. <laughs> Who's excited? I think we all are. <laughs> I think we all are excited. So um, the next whiskey that we're going to try is Redbreast Dream Cask, um, 3.0 as some people call it. Um, it is the, you know, some people have said this is the third Redbreast Dream Cask. This is actually the fourth Redbreast Dream Cask, although the first two were the same cask, confusingly. So uh, let's grab our Redbreast Dream Cask. And uh, I'm going to use a Tua glass for this, this one. So, unfortunately, they, weren't, they were smart enough not to give me a bottle with a label. But I can assure you this is Redbreast Dreamcast. Look at the colour. It is just absolutely um, unbelievable. Really rich depth of colour. Yeah, it's stunning, isn't it, Michael? It's really, really deep, rich colour. So um, I'm gonna. Oh my gosh! Wow. Okay. So let me just tell you a little bit about Redbreast Dreamcast. So in 2016, Billy Lighton, to celebrate World Whiskey Day, uh, decided to. Someone had asked him, um, "What is your favorite? You know, if you were to pick any barrel of whiskey in the distillery, what would you pick?" And Billy thought, wouldn't it be a good idea uh, to find that barrel? So he did pick a uh, pick a barrel. So he picked the 32-year-old uh, Redbreast All Sherry. It was sorry, it was actually 31-year-old in 2016, an All Sherry um, barrel. Just an absolutely stunning whiskey. And you know, up to this point, I would have said that's in my mind 
It's my favorite whiskey that's in a bottle. Uh, I've tasted some amazing whiskeys from Middleton um, and uh, the Rebrus 32 year old dream cask uh, was absolutely stunning, but it was a 31 year old in 2016. And then in 2017, they decided on the Redbreast Birdhouse to release, to bottle the whole barrel and release it as a, um, a, a special whiskey, I, I suppose to reward whiskey drinkers. Um, so it is, it is, and Paddy, I'm like so many, it is, look, lots of people missed out on the first one, the second one, the third one. I missed out on the first one. I was in the States uh, with work and I was in, in my uh, birthday suit at uh, eight o'clock in the morning after doing a whiskey event the night before, trying to log on and get a bottle and it wouldn't accept my credit card because it was in, it, the, it was geo-blocked and it was in the US, so it was going mad. Um, and then I got a bottle of PX uh, because I had uh, an iPhone, an iPad, a laptop open, you know, and I was doing all that. And then this year I missed out, but you know, I'm lucky enough that I, you know, obviously get some some to try. And what I've done every year is ask the distillery and the Redbreast team for tasting stock so I can do tastings in person usually with El Mulligan Grocer or say with people like the Waterford Whiskey Society or the Irish Whiskey Society, Cork Whiskey Society. So that a lot of people who didn't get to try to get a bottle would be able to try it. This year is a little more challenging, obviously, because um, we're not really able to do tastings in person or I haven't tried that yet. So this is the first time that Redbreast Dream Cask has been essentially tasted as a part of a festival. So um, we're very lucky. So let's let's get on to the whiskey and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. So the whiskey itself um, is uh, made up of uh, four, actually four casks of whiskey. So you had a, um, and the way to explain that is, remember I talked to you about Reverest 12 year old. Reverest 12 year old is essentially three different cast types and two different types of pot still. In the case of uh, Redbreast 28 year old, it contains all of the pot stills that we produce in Middleton with a, a um, healthy helping of trad pot, which is our most, I suppose, loved uh, type of pot still. It's in healthy amounts and things like Redbreast 21 year old or Jemison 15 year old. If you're lucky to ever try it, it was all um, this trad pot. But basically the whiskey in this case is 28 years of age. Um, what you've got is one cast that was distilled in 1989. Uh, it's matured in basically an ex-bourbon bar barrel and then was recast in 1995 into a ruby port cask. Now remember that ruby port cask because that's important to the, the end of what I'm going to tell you now. So it was 1989. It spent uh, essentially um, about five years in a uh, ex-bourbon barrel, first filled ex-bourbon, and then it was recast into a bourbon, into a ruby pour cask for an additional uh, 15 years. And, sorry, an additional 25 years. And then the second cask was a single pot still, um, another single pot still whiskey that was distilled in 1991, and it was matured in a second fill ex-bourbon. And that is one type of pot still in both of those, uh, both of those barrels there. Then we get on to a, another single pot still whiskey, which is a different type of pot still, uh, which is um, uh, matured, distilled in 1991, and again matured in second uh, fill X bourbon barrel. Um, and as I said to you, if you're maturing a whiskey for a long period of time, in this case, for nearly 29 years, you'd want something that is a refill barrel, otherwise it'd be totally dominated uh, by the wood. So a first fill, really a bit looking at you know, 25, 26 years, and then after that, the whiskey would not improve. I wouldn't say it would disimprove, but it just wouldn't um, be maybe be as good. So in the case here where we're aging something for nearly 29 years, it is essentially a refill, a second fill bourbon barrel. And then the fourth cask was a single pot, so whiskey again aged, distilled in 1991, matured in an ex-bourbon barrel, and recast into a sherry butt 
in 2011. So essentially you've got um, 20 years in a ex bourbon, so a first fill bourbon, and then recast into a, a first fill sherry in 2011 for nine years. But volume wise, what happens is these, all these barrels were vatted and then they were put into that ruby pour cast that I talked to you about um, where the initial ex bourbon barrel was recast in 1995. So it's still a single cask of whiskey, uh, but essentially all of those barrels were recast back in to that ruby port cask. So the ruby port cask, uh, it, it is a ruby port cask finish, but there is a huge proportion of influence here from whiskey that was aged in a ruby port cask for 25 years. There is also massive influence here from that sherry butt I was talking about that it was refilled into in 2011. This whiskey is a fortified wine bomb. So have a nose, have a nose of it. So it's incredibly rich and beautiful, uh, beautiful notes to it. Like, you know, kind of, so almost a kiwi juicy, kiwi melon, that type of note, note a nuttiness to it, an almond nuttiness to it. There's definitely that vanilla there again, big, you know, the American oak barrels, but also the Spanish and the Portuguese oak are giving you vanilla, you know, that kind of, uh, again, that red breast signature of cinnamon and nutmeg coming from those Spanish oak barrels. Um, like there's a big oak contribution here, but there's also a little bit of mintiness, like a mint herb, a herbal type note to it, a lighter type note. It's really, really interesting. Now let's have a sip, Slauncha. I really don't think I have to say anything there. <laughs> it's so tropical, it really is, you know. It's, it's like that, um, I don't know what you call it, kiwi tanginess, and, but it's not like kiwi, I, it's just what I'd say, but almost like, um, huge sweet just waves of spiciness coming over your palate and the finish is just sublime it's a beautiful finish it's definitely definitely i'm having another sip and like gorgeous Awesome. It's a massive step up, say from from twenty one. You know, there's a that that tropical fruitness, that kiwi, the passion fruit. You know, it's, it's it's all there. It's banging there. But you, even when you've got all these sort of this that layer of flavour, yeah, you can still tell it's red breast. If you know what I mean. I still yes. that sort of a little bit of that touch of mustiness. You know that leatheriness that you see in red breast twenty one. You know that age. It's there. You know it's. You know, this does, as, as we've drunk a 12 or 15 and we're on to this, you can tell this is red breast, you know. This is not like deviating a million miles away, you know. It's it's very much, you know, if you were the to... The DNA, DNA yeah, red breast. Yeah, yeah. If you were to try, try all these three blinds, you would pick this out as probably the oldest one without a doubt and you'd know it was the Dreamcast, but you'd still know that you tried three red breasts, you know. It really is, and like it's cast strength, you know, it's 51.5% ABV, but I would not be, I would not be adding any water to that, <laughs> personally. Um, you know, it's, it's just amazing that every year they're challenged with coming up with something different and the Pedro Jimenez last year was maybe what I would call not not a flavor profile that people um Irish people are familiar with um but definitely the fortified wine influence in here with this Oloroso sherry and uh, this tawny ruby port 
are giving you loads and loads of influence. Yeah, I was up, uh, up my allotment there at last after on Sunday there after the festival, getting some fresh air, and I was harvesting all my gooseberries and black currants. And this, and I mean, my black currants are amazing, and then I probably yeah. ate more than I harvested and brought back. And I've been eating black currants all week, and you know, then it's you know when you put that that flavour in your in your senses for a while. And yeah, you, you can, I can now. I, I really pick out the black corn on this now towards the end. It's like it's part of the finish. It's really there, and it's one of these dark, rich red fruits that you'd expect to, to taste with when you have like a, a port pipe involved here. You know, um, it's amazing. But this this is a this is a sort of whiskey that's just going to keep giving and giving, isn't it? You know, you know, you you would you would easily drink a five hundred mil bottle of this in a. In a in one sitting, <laughs> if you were allowed to, you know, if you could afford to, you know. You'd definitely go, you'd definitely be asleep for a long while after. <laughs> um, it's, the thing about it is, is that it is, um, you know, wonderfully rich, but it just shows you the quality of the casts that are used in this. And, you know, it's important to call out the relationship that there is between Middleton Distillery and the um, producers in, Galicia or the sawmill in Galicia, the Baria sawmill in Mad the Madabar sawmill in Baria in Galicia. Um, and in Portugal, we've uh, built a relationship with um, an ex, you know, a guy who used to work for Sandyman and um, who has helped us to source a cooperage just outside Porto that um, is able to produce barrels that are of equal quality to the Pais Lavado Cooperage in Jerez. And it is testament to Kevin O'Gorman when he was in his role as master of maturation that he took the work of Brenda Monks and essentially, um, you know, Brenda Monks is the, is the man that would have been responsible for sourcing the barrels that have been used, you know, in this whiskey. But I think the future is just as bright that we've secured essentially his gut. Um, Good, you know, as good barrels going forward. Um, and there's a question there from Paddy: Will the ballot, uh, will it, it be ballot sales in the future? Yes, Paddy, it will be. Um, I mean, this year we had some issues with a lot, uh, you know, ca accounts that weren't really linked to real people and stuff like that. And uh, the team did huge work in trying to figure out who were real and who weren't real, and they, you know, deleted over 100 accounts and cancelled and uh, nearly 30 uh, bottles that were being sent out to these, you know, the emails, confirmation emails. Next year, I think there will be some requirement for a debit card or cre credit card to ensure your ballot. Um, and I think this year we weren't, we're just very conscious that there could be the situation where we were coming into uh, you know, lockdown and there could have been a situation where someone had, you know, essentially been in a terrible position of losing their job and it would have been an awful thing if, you know, we debited a, um, essentially 500 euro for a, a, a bottle of whiskey from their account. So it was really felt this year that they didn't want to do that. But I think next year it will be uh, something that will stop um, make it even more fairer, but they went to huge lengths this year to to um, check every bottle that was where it was being sent to, it was being sent to, etc., to make sure there were real people. But yes, it will be a ballot going forward, Paddy. Paddy, how many bank accounts have you got? The one from AIB, Bank of Ireland, Ulster Bank, KBC, Revolut. <laughs> you can have as many bank accounts as you want. You have to have the money to put in them. <laughs> That's true. Um, so um, there will, 100% there will be a, you know, a, a Dreamcast next year. But also I'd ask you if you're not members of the Redbreast Dreamcast Birdhouse, go, the Redbreast Birdhouse, I should say, go to www.redbreastwhiskey.com forward slash birdhouse um, and just join the birdhouse. All you have to do is put in your email address and your date of birth and you become a member but it means then and click all the options to receive emails and all that sort of stuff because some people said they didn't receive an email etc uh, this year but the difficulty is is that if you signed up pre 
2018, uh, whatever way the GD, the, the uh, what's it called, GDPR uh, works, um, unless you signed up after 2018, we're not allowed to send you emails. So it's not, it's very unfortunate that way. Uh, but if you're not a member, please do sign up. And there may be exciting things coming from the birdhouse uh, soon. So I would, I would definitely uh, give it a, I would definitely sign up. It would really be worth your while. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Um, so Liam says, is, is there any less sherry influence on the Middleton brand pot stills than the Redbreast pot stills? I know there's new oak in dark oak. Liam, there's no sherry uh, at all in the uh, Middleton range. So in Middleton dark oak, look, Middleton, a uh, very rare 2019 or any of the other Middleton very rares. There's no sherry at all. It's all American oak. And in Barry Crockett Legacy, it's virgin uh, American oak as well as first and second Phil Bourbon. So that's the thing with the Middleton range. There is the Irish oak, as I said, um, in the dark grey look, but there's no sherry in all the range. Bar one, sherry, 100% sherry that was in Dublin Airport. So that was an anomaly. Uh, it was in the loop, uh, but there was a hundred percent sherry aged uh, Middleton very rare in the loop. But that's that was, um, you know, the only one as well as a virgin American oak, hundred percent virgin American oak in Dublin Airport as well. So um, that's just a good question, all the same. Um, so let's get on to if you how are you doing? Are you through your uh, Dreamcast yet, everyone? Yeah, sadly, you're all finished. Nothing left. Oh, well, okay. You can smell the bottle. <laughs> so, so the next whiskey, the next whiskey that we're going to try is Redbreast Cast Strength. Now, the reason we're tasting this last is because this whiskey is first fill bourbon, first fill sherry, and those two types of pot stills. There is absolutely no difference between the whiskey, uh, whiskies that are in Redbreast um, 12 year old, as there is in Redbreast Castrate. The difference is this is bottle at Castrate and is a slightly less number of casks. This particular whiskey is 55.8% ABV. You can see here on the label, you can see the ABV plus B1 19. So batch, batch two, sorry, it says B2, right there, B219. So this is the first time that we did a second batch in Ireland in the uh, one year. Previously, we had done enough, but because of increasing demand uh, and because it has uh, grown, we're actually making, we, what we did first of all was just increase increase the batch size, or I should say, Billy Lighton and Dave McCabe, our blenders, increased the batch size. So it went from 28 casks of whiskey originally, about one third approximately are, say, sherry butts, and one third or two thirds are those American oak barrels. So that's roughly the proportion of casks. They increased the batch to about 60 barrels, so they doubled the volume, but kept the proportions the same. And then over the years, we're up now at about 100 casks of whiskey. Um, again, the proportions are similar, one third and two thirds. But as I said, two different types of pot stills. One of those exclusively aged in uh, first fill bourbon and one aged in first fill bourbon and first fill sherry. And aged for 12 to 15 years. The difference is this is bottle of cast strain and a slightly smaller batch. Every batch of Rebra's 12 year old is about 128 barrels of whiskey. So, but this is now about 100 barrels of whiskey. Now, in my mind, that's not a lot of barrels of whiskey when you consider this is the largest selling pot still whiskey in the world. Um, but every batch of Jemison they make is only about a similar batch as well. And that's because our vats only take a certain amount of volume. So there's no point in making four and more barrels in because we haven't got vats big enough um, in Middleton to take um, more than say 130, 140 barrels of whiskey. So that's that's why 
they're probably in batches of that size. It's more about what the makeup is of those casks in there. Now, what's the difference with this whiskey? It's all of those delicious flavors that you love in Rebrest 12 year old, but concentrated down and a hell, a hell of a lot more alcohol. So you're gone from 40% to 58 point, you know, 58.5%. So which is just 55.8, I should say, 55.8%. So when you lift up your glass, have a little nose of it. Be aware this is cast strength and much punchier than the dream cask is. Woo! So it's, uh, it'll wake you up anyway. Um, just an incredible concentration of those red berries and fruits. Uh, you're looking at kind of, you know, current and, um, you know, rich kind of uh, rich red fruits or like, you know, strawberries, raspberries, that type of type of um, compost, you know, really reduced down. A lot more alcohol, a lot more pepperiness to it as well. So that lovely peppery spiciness that you get in red breast, which kind of like cinnamon nutmeg is more like black pepper here. It's quite, quite intense. Um, it's wonderfully put together. I mean, it's still at 55.8%. It's going to be a really, it's really easy to nose even at that. But let, look at it in the glass, if you can. I know I can't, I, you can't really see the, see it on the glass here, but look at it in the glass, how viscous it is along the side of the glass. So again, it's going to have a lovely, buttery, oily type character, like a really fine olive oil on your palate. Now let's, the proof is in the drinking, as I say. So have a little sip, it's launch it. You can see, you can see why we're trying this last, not because it isn't, it isn't uh, gorgeous and delicious and luscious and buttery and peppery um, as, you know, as Paul was saying there. And, but basically, the reason we're tasting this last is this is totally dominating my palate. It is peppery, there's loads of wood compounds in here, loaded off vanillic acid, but the sweetness is really balanced by the, what I would call the intensity of the alcohol here. This is nearly, you know, almost 60% alcohol, you know, and that alcohol is delicious. It really is. You have to remember the, the quality of the spirit in here is just stunning. The length is massive. Little bit of a little bit of a punch there at the back, I won't lie to you. Um, you know, they say, an old Irish saying, never water another man's whiskey. Um, but in this, again, I'd be reluctant to add water to it, but you wouldn't, I wouldn't be, um, I wouldn't be admonishing anyone if they did add a few drops of water to this. I think it will really uh, open it up. I actually might give that a little, a little try myself. Got my glass of uh, Dublin Corporation water here. Yeah, really, it really does. It, it opens it up. There's a little less of that intensity uh, there, but like I put a tiny drop of water in there. It's not much. Mm. Much more of the fruit. I think you might you'd agree. Less of the punch in the center of the palate. Yeah, and get much more of that fruit on the palate. The finish is still as long um very long finish yeah it's beautiful and um, it is so just to explain to you about uh about cast strength so you notice it doesn't say 12 year old anymore in in numbers but it does say it in letters down here um. so it is still a 12 year old whiskey um and there's no other reason in that we wanted to call out the cast strength more than the 12-year-old. And also there was a lot of 
Michael, you'll understand this. Behind the bar, you maybe less experienced staff picking up cast strength and pouring your margin into a glass. So, uh, yeah, and Paddy's laughing too. He knows what I'm talking about. So, um, basically, the bottles were identical previously. Now they look different. So that's another reason behind it. And also, um, we wanted to call out the cast strength because that's what consumers told us they were interested in. The batches that are made for Ireland, were, are, all the batches are made on a ad hoc, uh, yes, you have, Paddy, I've seen it. Uh, Paddy's been on both sides of the bar, and so has Michael. I've been there with them both. Um, and the reason uh, behind, you know, the way you might hear of a certain batch of a certain ABV down in South Africa or one in America, the reason that there is different batches is down to simply the local market, which Ireland is a market, would ring up ring up uh, the blenders and say, we're running a bit low there on the cast strain, will you make up some more? And then they make it up specifically for that country. And whatever strength it comes out at, because it's made a cast strain, it comes out at. We fill our barrels at 63.4% ABV, our pot still barrels. And that is to maximize interaction, minimize evaporation. And it just seems to be the sweet spot that they've found uh, where they will uh, fill the barrels in Middleton. So when you mix together barrels that are 12 to 15 years of age, usually they'll all be under 60% ABV and over about 55%. So th there's nothing, there's no other way of knowing what the ABV is going to be other than when you make up the final batch, literally testing it and finding out, gauging it and saying, oh, it's this ABV. So there's no water added. Uh, it is, there is water added. When it comes off the still, it comes off at about 84.5% alcohol, and it's reduced down to 63.4% before filling. And that's because in Scotland, it will come off the still at cast filling strength or near, near there or about, um, double the stilling and the size of the stills. In Ireland, with triple, triple distillation, you're bringing that alcohol strength up much higher than would be suitable for cask filling strength. And if you did put it in at 84.5%, you would get a, a phenomenon called barrel burn. And what that does is essentially the alcohol and the acids are so strong in there that basically what will happen is it will burn the inside of the barrel and it won't mature or it won't mature at any uh, good rate. So that sweet spot is about 63.4% ABV for a pot still pot still whiskey is what we fill our barrels at. So uh, it's, yeah, I, I just, I, I love it. I mean, there's a time and a place for it. Don't get me wrong, because it's, uh, it is uh, very potent. You know, two, two uh, measures of red breast cast strength and you'll be, you know, it certainly is, it does pack a punch, but it's, if you like all those flavors, you like in red breast, concentrate it down. And as God, in, God intended from the barrel, well, th this is it. You know, any any questions on the red breast cast strain? They're all a quiet bunch tonight. <laughs> they're they're very polite. So Liam is saying, Caden heads were selling a lot of single cask old Irish bottles in the nineties, and the ABV was incredibly high, seventy five percent and up. Yeah, um, I mean we've reduced the ABV that we fill our barrels, Liam, um, particularly under, as that gentleman mentioned, Brendan Monks. There was a lot of experimentation done in the early 70s around every part of the process, you know, from this brewing, distillation, but in maturation in particular, particular they decided to um, really, forensically look at standardizing the process in Middleton because if you think about it in the past Liam we had two distilleries in Dublin and we had a couple in Cork and they were all doing different things they're all distilling differently they're all but they were also maturing the barrels in different in different ways as well we had wet uh, warehouses that were underneath the river line in Dublin uh, we had 
you know, don't eat where there were don't eat warehouses, so we'd only eat barrels three high. Um, we had warehousing on the quays in Dublin. We had warehousing underground, and you know, in, we were where we were warehousing barrels in railway tunnels, all sorts of stuff. And it meant that there was huge variation, and it made it more difficult to manage the stock and also figure out what you had. So a lot of the stuff you would have tasted, uh, Liam, from those Caden heads would have been stock that was sold um, as uh, wholesale stock by Jamison in particular, because that's what they did until the late 60s. It was mainly the supply of wholesale. Um, new make spirit, and those barrels then would have been filled uh, of whatever, um, whatever strength the merchant wanted them filled at. And I like to see, I say you never tried it. I haven't either, but I have tried some of the old um, Jemison stuff and I'd be pretty confident that the whiskey produced now today is a lot better than the old stuff. It's nice to taste it, um, but it was really up to the merchant. You know, like Gilby's were had decent quality casks, but there were some other guys, had, I've tasted some awful stuff as well from some of the other uh, wholesalers that used to bottle. Uh, bottle stuff and but it's in, it's interesting now there's what 1.6 million barrels in Middleton and they mature them uh, all in the same way so you get consistency in all the product and quality is standard as well yeah and your older powers is good uh, but older gems wasn't great I'd, I'd agree with that and I think that's down to wood management and also powers had control over their inventory and whereas Bow Street, as I mentioned to you, until the 1960s, were, you know, selling on, like you think about it, Gilby's bought, you know, new make spirit that looked like that. And then they matured it in their own uh, fortified wine casks, as did Mitchell's, etc. They didn't actually buy matured whiskey stock. Um, even the Cooperage that is often pictured around Bow Street, that was a, a private company. And they would have sold the barrels to people collecting whiskey as opposed to to the distillery itself in Bow Street. So it's a different, anyway, today it's a different operation and uh, really um, early 1970s, a lot of what we consider the standard in the world whiskey industry was developed in Middleton. Stuff like palletizing. Uh, if you go to Speyside today and you go into a warehouse, you'll see, you know, whiskey all palletized and that was pioneered in Middleton in the early 1970s. So. I know it doesn't sound very sexy, but that's 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 what an innovative place Middleton is. And around maturation, they did lots of things like putting barrels and bags and all this sort of stuff to try and reduce the angel share. They did lots of different experimentation around, um, you know, pressurizing rooms and trying all sorts of stuff. And they found that leaving it in a barrel in a warehouse for a period of time, nothing can can replicate that so that's what we do today no temperature control no nothing just put it in a warehouse leave it there come back a couple of years later and bob's your uncle and drink it so um any other any other questions there yeah jerry Ger hi th thanks for the presentation and the, and the chance to taste red breast um the dreamcast is amazing but um just a, a more general one on like almost a craze or maybe uh I suppose people looking for cast strength stuff. Like it seems to be that's the trend or the fashion maybe at the moment. Everyone just wants cast strength if they can get their hands on it of, of, of every brand. What, why do you think that is? Or I think it's it's down to people being spoiled and going to going to the distilleries and tasting whiskey out of barrels. And there really wasn't the opportunity to do this. Um, you know, Michael will tell you ten years ago. You know, the distilleries weren't there and also access to the distilleries in Ireland anyway weren't there. But now yeah. you can go to, you know, a number of distilleries um, in Dublin or to Dublin's only licensed um, maturation warehouse in Bow Street and you can do a cask crawl and you can taste whiskey from a barrel. Um, yeah. Or you can go to distilleries in, you know, Dingle or in, uh, you know, up to Bushmills or whatever. This wasn't really a thing in the past, Paul, and now it is. I think people are 
exposed to a style of whiskey that wouldn't have been widely tasted or available previously and now that's just generated demand because they they also get to do tastings where they get to taste a lot of this and also a lot of the single casks are bottled at cast strength now as well which again there wouldn't have been believed even five or six years ago there wouldn't be believed been believed to be the market there for for this you know red breast cast strength was really a very niche product uh, for specialist off licenses like El Mulligan Grocer or um, you know the, the likes of other specialist whiskey shops in France or Germany and now um, there's much more demand and I noticed there was a bit of uh, you know there was other another whiskey festival which will remain unnamed online but they had a Powers um, John's Lane at Cast Rink. And there was, you know, a lot of people saying, where can we get it and why? Don't know, Paddy, don't know what you're talking about. There's only one El Mulligan Grocer's Whiskey Vessel. And it's also a lovely place to visit for somewhere to eat over in uh, Stony Batter as well, if you're if you're over in Stony Batter. But the, um, the I think a lot, a lot of that is to do with just having more access to these places as opposed to... Um, you know, just people waking up in the morning and saying, oh, I want cast rain whiskey. I think it's because they've been exposed to it and they like it. And that would be my reasoning on it. Um, I just hope it's available. I've noticed over the last few weeks as well, we've introduced cast rain whiskeys to our tastings over the last few months and bringing them in. And you can see the, the uptake in them. And then we've done a full range of cast strains with, with another distillery or Tipperary there. And we've seen that. And that's the reason sort of tonight that when we were selecting you could have put a 21 in here you could put Lestow in here and I said we'll put the cast strength in because we can see people now wanting to try it and so give them the opportunity to try, try it as well and I, I suppose as a feature of our tastings as well previously and now going forward we'll just keep introducing more cast strength because people want to try it as well and like for years in, in Scotland it, it was sort of a thing you, you got access to a lot of cast strength whiskies and, we're, and the reality is in Ireland we're just playing catch up Mm -hmm. catch up the, the consumers playing catch up I remember 10 years ago I knew pretty much all, most of the whiskey consumers in the country you know, yeah. now we're, just, we're seeing lots of different people come on board different ages you know it's, and it's, there's a whole new buzz around whiskey so as people get into whiskey they, they, they explore it more so they look for different things so you know if you're normally drinking red breast 12 year old and all of a sudden there's a red breast cast strength on the shelf you want to try that as well you try that and you like it so you explore within other brands as well and say, well, I've tried, tried their, their normal level of whiskey, but I want to try what have they got its cast strength. So you're constantly exploring and evolving, which is great because, you know, as much as Red Breast 12 is an amazing whiskey, you know, I wouldn't want to be drinking every day all the time. You know, I want to explore different whiskeys and you know, like, even like some of the Powers range and, like, yeah. so, and the Middleton range and even the Jameson range, which is quite explorative as well. So. It's nice to have that option because we have a Jameson 18 cast strength, don't we? As, as a, a, alongside the, the regular 18 Jameson. So there's lots of nice introductions of bringing us all along as a, as a consumer in Ireland, and it's, it's fantastic to see. It's the whiskey uh, drinker in Ireland has become more discerning, mm -hmm. and it's you know through no small uh, contribution of you know places like. Ella Mulligan Grocer, where they're able to bring consumers on a journey because the staff have the knowledge. Um, the way, you know, you're not going to get it in Tesco. You know, Tesco is a fine store, don't get me wrong, but the difference is, is that when you go to a speciality whiskey um, store, they're able to help you with your education and also find out where you are in your whiskey journey and then able to bring you into it. And these places didn't exist until people like Michael come over here, um, like his predecessor. Um, oh, Scotsman as well. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to mention, I wasn't, I wasn't no, going to. We're all friends, we're all friends, you know. I was going to mention uh, a fella called John Jemison from oh. Ottawa, that fella. So he, he came over and married your one Haig, uh, whose father had a couple of distilleries in Rings End. So, but it is, uh, it is true that unfortunately the knowledge had been forgotten here by both Burr bartenders, people working in Irish distillers, and I and openly admit when I started in the company, as we call it, back in 2001, 
I could not have told you uh, what uh, whiskey was made from. I thought it was vodka with uh, colouring in it. And I'll be totally honest with you. But what happened was I met people like Barry Crockett and et cetera, and they were able to, you know, I, I just got it absolute bitten by the bug and really loved the history, the people around it. It's a really, just such a great community. Um, and also the products are 100% made here. They're, they're, you know, made from raw materials from here. Like how many things have we invented in Ireland and packaged and sent around the world? You know, and we, you know, whiskey is one of them. You know, it's just absolutely amazing that it started here in Ireland all those centuries ago. And now we're, we're, we're rediscovering it ourselves and we're just on a different journey. We just haven't had the knowledge previously, but I think consumers now are so much more knowledgeable about it. And that's why they're attracting, you know, these different products as well. And as Liam Smith said, we invented uh, cheese and onion crisps <laughs> as well. Good point, Liam. <laughs> yeah, um, and Liam, just quickly to answer your question about the 15-year-old Jemison. So the 15-year-old Jemison Black Label export that you're talking about, which appeared both in a, that, that uh, almost hexagonal or six-sided bottle. Uh, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah, that was a... It was, a, it was like a... Uh, well, uh, there was a, that great pot still from the millennium was was the, um, the the one I'm talking about was the really yeah. old one from the 60s or 70s that had a horrible yeah. taste on it. But yeah, but it, yeah obviously the, the one from around the millennium was fantastic. So the one the one you're talking about was a um, there was a 15 Italian and 12 year old. Like, yeah, it was for the Italian market. So the stock would have been from Dublin, and uh, it would it wouldn't have been obviously Middleton stock. And as I said to you, the wood management program that was in Bow Street in particular, you would have had grain whiskey that was distilled in John's Lane, and you would have had it blended with whiskey that was probably even much older than 15 year old um, from Bow Street. And that's, that's what you're drinking there. And it is earthy, um, musty, you know. Shocking, almost, it was shocking me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know I tried it, but it's interesting because it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It makes you appreciate how good the whiskey is there. Oh today. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it was, the older powers is much better actually. It I is, but I've tried. Yeah. Yeah, but was it gold label? Was it the old gold label pot still or? Yeah, and actually the the very first the one time um, John Clement Ryan came to the whiskey society one time and he brought actually the very first blended powers, and that yeah. was really, really nice. Actually, really really good. You know. Apparently, he, apparently, allegedly, he snuck in column stills into John's Lane to make the, the grain or something. Well, he, he didn't snuck, sneak them in. What he did is he brought them in to make vodka and gin. Oh, that was it. Okay. And then ended up it using it to, to put away whiskey. Yeah. But he did make, uh, there was a Powers Silver Label gin oh, as yeah. well. Yeah. yeah. And then um, there was a delicious vodka, which name escapes me. Um, it, it wasn't Hazar. It was a different one. It was called, oh, God, the name's totally gone out of my head. And I used to sell it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It was a. Was it, it was brew? A, was it brew there? No, no, no. Brew, brew was um, uh, brew was our friend uh, from PJ Rigney actually. Oh, so right. he was um, he was involved in that. Uh, so he was involved in s setting that up. No, it was um. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what vodka vodka it was, but that's that's it. But also the powers would have had very little grain whiskey in it. Um, so uh, that that's the other thing. But anyway, look, um, the fifteen-year-old. We're making much better whiskey now today, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I really hope you've enjoyed your journey through the uh, Redbreast, some of the Redbreast family. And again, I want to thank El Mulligan Grocer, Michael, and all the staff there as well for putting this festival together and allowing us to essentially. Um, Come on and have a few drinks and have a chat with everybody. So, um, thanks. What drink to all your health? So, sláinte. Oh, to toast, much, yeah. to toast makers everywhere. <laughs> sláinte. That was one of the best um, red breast cast drinks I've ever had. Actually, I must mm. say, probably maybe my very, very favorite. Actually, I think.
it's really fruity, isn't it? It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, it? lovely. yeah. yeah that was a bottle girl. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's impressive. <laughs> oh, by the way, if you do do a bottle kill and you take a photo of your bottle showing the bottle number and um, tag Red Breast Whiskey on Instagram um, or on Twitter and you will be receive something very nice in the future, I believe. So I've been told. So Another uh, bottle. <laughs> no, not another bottle. But as, as I said to you, it's very important you sign up to the birdhouse. It will really, really be worth your while. Right. So I'm maybe not before maybe, yeah. maybe not before Christmas, but um shortly afterwards. Okay. Right. So make sure you sign up. Good. Can you answer the trad pot question or not? No. Sorry? You can't answer the trad pot question, no. What what was the trad pot question? Any chance of any trad pot? <laughs> oh well, we're always saying that, you know. Um any chance of well, like a hundred percent trad pot whiskey? Um or well, you know, something that would work. Yeah, there's not there's nothing at the moment, Liam. And uh, there may be a single cast that will be released before Christmas with a a um very well known hotel uh that will be Tradpot. But I mean other than that, I think the difficulty is is we haven't got a lot of it and it's very expensive um to produce. So there is all of these older whiskies. Those 1.6 million barrels, by far, 90, 95% of it is all Jemison. So, it, you know, if you think 8.4 yeah, million yeah, yeah, yeah. cases yeah. are sold. So we have very little of this older stuff. And, I, of course, I'd love everything just to be in trad pot. I'd swim around in this and drink it all day. You know, you can, it, it is, um, oh, it's wonderful. It gives you all those stone fruit characteristics, those tropical fruit notes that Michael was talking about in the, the Dreamcast. But... The answer is, in the foreseeable future, say the next six to nine months, no, there isn't anything. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no, thank you, thank you. Well, thanks very much, Jer. Uh, thanks for your time this night, and thank you, Rowan, as well. Um, it's been great. Um, we'll finish up there. Uh, for anyone who's interested, next week it's sold out, but we have an Indian whiskey tasting. It should be interesting. Oh, okay. And in two weeks today, we have an Ireland v Australia whiskey tasting should be equally interesting. Uh, there's still tickets available for that. It's a larger group, so we can sell more tickets. There's more whiskey available there. So if you're interested in that, they're available online at lmulliganwhiskeyshop.com. And uh, who knows, we've got a few more interesting events coming up as well. We'll keep, we'll keep running them every week because we're aware that it's great that people who don't live in Dublin who can't come to the live events can still watch online. And, uh, even though we might all be zoomed out at this stage, you know, once a week won't do any harm, you know. <laughs> so uh, thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone.